Hello folks, this is Sridhar Ramakrishnan. Welcome to our webinar this month. Before we get started, a few bookkeeping items. First, the presentation will begin shortly and go on till approximately 1 p.m. Professor Miller has consented to stay on for a bit after 1 p.m. to address any questions that people may have. The slides and the recording will be available at the end of the presentation. Log into your Millibo account to view them. Please keep your telephone or microphone muted at all times. Only unmute yourself to ask questions. If you have dialed into the conference by phone, you must have entered your audio pin. I can only unmute you if you do so. For those of you who prefer to ask questions by instant message, there's a chat window. Please ask your question there. Professor Miller has indicated that he welcomes dialogue and questions, so please ask questions or share your comments as you have them. With that, let's get started. Today we are delighted to have Professor Ethan Miller to talk with us about Weighted by Photos Go, Challenges in Preserving Digital Data for the Long Term. Dr. Miller is a professor in the Computer Science Department at the University of California, Santa Cruz, where he's the Director for the Cooperative Research Center for Research and Storage Systems and the Associate Director for Storage Systems Research Center. He received his bachelor's from Brown University in 1987 and his PhD from UC Berkeley in 1995, and he's been on the UC Santa Cruz faculty since 2000. He's co-authored over 120 papers on a number of topics in file and storage systems, operating systems, parallel and distributed systems, information retrieval, and computer security. He was a member of the team that developed Ceph, a scalable high-performance distributed file system for scientific computing that is now being adopted by several high-end computing organizations. His work on reliability and security for distributed storage is also widely recognized, as is his work on secure, efficient, long-term archival storage and scalable metadata systems. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Professor Miller. Okay, so what we're going to talk about today is challenges that people face in preserving digital data for a very long time. And I've been working on archival storage, digital archival storage, for a long time, uh, actually at least a decade if not more. So what we're going to talk about today is what are the challenges of preserving data for the long term and what are some of the things people have done to try and help with this. So. Before we get to that, of course, we have to talk about what preserving data actually means. And preserving data is really two things that are kind of related, but not, not entirely. The first one is preserving information, preserving actual bits, and so on. Right? Ensuring that you can read information later that you've stored today. And in order, in order to do this, we're going to have to do a couple of things. We're going to have to have periodic refreshes, maybe of the information, maybe of the bit of the media, and so on. But there's a second problem, and that is that not only do we have to preserve the bits themselves, we have to preserve meaning. So I can hand you a bunch of stuff, and uh, if you can't read it, well, I mean, you've got the bits, but you don't know what they mean. And for those of you who don't think of this as a big problem, think about what would happen if someone handed you a JPEG and didn't give you the JPEG spec. So it may not be sufficient just to preserve the bits. Now, there is some functionality that's a little bit a uh, function of both. Okay. So, for example, uh, information integrity. Hold on a sec. I've got to tell my uh, screensaver not to kick in. This will take a moment. Okay. Okay. So, something like integrity is really a little bit of both. In other words, if I want to know if these bits have been changed over time, I've got to be able to get the bits back. But if I don't know what the bits mean, how do I know if there's integrity or not? So the question that, of course, comes up is, uh, well, great, this is a nice research area, but why is this so important? Why do we care about this? Well, the reason we care about this is that we pass all the stuff we do onto future generations physically. Okay? Information isn't encoded genetically. At least, well, at least the information we pass on isn't. So since we've only been doing digital information preservation for, I don't know, 40, 50 years or a little bit more, we've been doing analog for a lot longer. In fact, thousands of years. So historically, we did information anal in, in analog, uh, either oral or written. And today, though, we don't do analog as much. The vast majority of data that we generate is digital. It never exists in any form other than bits. So because of this, we're going to have to make sure this digital data can be passed on to future generations, and we've got to deal with challenges that are unique. But before we get started with that, it may be useful to talk about you know, what some of the challenges are. By the way, the picture on here I bring up for a reason. That picture was taken, uh, that's a picture of me, of course, and that was taken about 25 years ago. It's uh, down in Mexico, actually, and it was taken on film. 25 years later, I had no trouble at all taking it and digitizing it. 
The digital for the digital image, however, who knows whether I'll be able to read that 25 years later. That's the challenge that we've got to solve. So as I said, it's been a challenge for a very long time to try and preserve data. Okay, people have wanted to do this for thousands of years, literally thousands of years. So originally, people actually passed things down verbally. Right. So there were, of course, integrity issues and. For those of you who don't think about this as an integrity issue, if you've ever played the game Telephone, which you play as a kid, you start off at one end, you whisper praise the person next to you, it goes through 20 people, and the person at the end comes out with uh, something that resembles what you said, not at all. So clearly integrity is going to be a very big issue. Okay? So of course what people said is, well, you know, if oral stuff isn't going to work as well, maybe we'll go for physical. And here we have four examples of analog, digital, uh, analog data preservation. On the upper left, we have ancient Chinese writing. In the middle, on the right-hand side, you've got hieroglyphs. The bottom left, you have a linear B tablet, and we are able to read that. In the bottom right, we have Mayan hieroglyphs uh, you know, from Central America. Now, of course, this is analog. It's not digital, but we can learn a lot from how um, okay. we can learn a lot from how it is that people are preserving analog data, we can apply that to digital data. So there are a couple of issues here that we have to worry about. The first one is going to be readability and, and reliability of the media itself. Can we actually deal with the media later? We have to worry about data integrity. Do people change things? And then we have to worry about preserving meaning. So we'll talk about each one of these in turn. First for analog, then we'll describe digital. So the first issue here is media reliability. And it turns out that some media are just more reliable than others. Well, Paper is very unreliable. You have to keep recopying it because paper breaks down quickly. Now, parchment, like the Torah scroll in the upper right and the Dead Sea Scrolls in the upper left, are reliable, but they're still vulnerable. That Dead Sea Scroll is 2,000 years old, and it only survived because it was in the desert with very dry, very dry temperatures, actually alkaline environment, and so on. And even then, it barely survived, as you can see. Now, it turns out that stone can be very, very reliable. You see the Egyptian hieroglyphs on the bottom right there. Uh, those are, of course, extremely reliable, right? But the thing here is that um, while stone is very reliable, it turns out that there are some issues with it. You can deliberately erase stone, and I have an example of this. So if you see at the bottom there, there's an inscription from Santa Fe. Okay. And it says, here, here's, a, here's a blown up version, to the heroes who have fallen in the various battles with something, Indians in the territory of New Mexico. Now, I don't know what they erased there, but you can very clearly see right here, somebody went back and actually physically erased the stone. Of course, this is the sort of thing that you, know, you might think is unusual, but in fact, it's actually very normal. Um, people have done this for a long time. In fact, the reason that Ramses II, the Egyptian pharaoh, is so, fa is so famous, sorry, Ramses the Great, is that his name was chiseled extremely deeply. So Ramses, well, you couldn't go and re-chisel things. You'd have to go too deep. Okay. So, you know, it certainly is the case that media is pretty good, but the way you deal with media vulnerability is you simply copy it over and over again. Now, if you copy it over and over again, you've got a different problem. And that problem is integrity. So, basically, if you have lots of copies, you might have potential errors. Now, I don't know how well this video will show up on this thing, but let's try it. Ever since people started recording information, there's been a need to duplicate. Very nice work, Brother Dominic. Thank you. Very nice. Now, I would like 500 more cents. Brother Dominic, how are you? Could you do a good job for me? Three is sets, Father. 500 sets, the last one. It's a miracle. So that was a Xerox ad from the mid-1970s, and it shows that monks would basically make, their, make copies over and over and over again. Now, of course, making 500 copies if there's a mistake doesn't really help, but you know, it turns out that making copies is a good way to make sure you avoid errors. Right? Now, a second thing that you could do to make sure your copies didn't actually make mistakes was to complicate the material. And here, you've got a picture of an illuminated uh, uh, page from the Book of Psalms. Now, notice that uh, they made the text very flowery. They made the page, in fact, very flowery. And by complicating the material, you make the monks spend longer on each page, and they pay an awful lot of attention to make sure they didn't make mistakes. 
So now over here, whoops, you've got a Torah scroll as well, and a Torah scroll has strict rules about how you can copy things, right? And if there's a single mistake at all, you basically have to get rid of that entire panel. So essentially, all of these things were designed to make sure that integrity is maintained. Now the problem, of course, is that integrity requires that you understand the material. I can read Hebrew, so I can tell you if the Torah scroll is right or not, given another Torah scroll, but if you couldn't read Hebrew, you can't copy it very well, right? How can you know that you've made a bad copy if you don't know what the copy actually means? Okay? So the next thing we have to worry about is preserving meaning, not just preserving the actual, uh, the actual media itself. Now, we make the assumption very often that languages remain static and that symbols remain static. But over long periods of time, everything, literally everything, changes. So when we think about future users and reading our data, well, we've got a couple of things to worry about. And to give you an example, on the right we have two examples of writing found in almost exactly the same place on the island of Crete. On the top, we have linear B, which, by the way, deciphering this was a very big, difficult thing. On the bottom, we actually have linear A. We have no idea what it means. We literally have no idea. Okay? Now, unless you think, okay, well, Crete, they're gone right now, no problem. Again, using ancient Hebrew as an example, there are quite a few words in the Torah that only appear once. Now, we know what they're kind of meaning because, of course, they're in a sentence saying something, but we don't know exactly what they mean. For example, there's an animal, and we you know, well, I know it's an animal, but I don't know what kind of animal. And it might matter a lot if you don't know whether this is a bird or what kind of bird it is. It can create a problem. Okay? So if you want to preserve meaning as time goes on, we have a couple of approaches here. The first one we can do is to translate our text as we copy it. And this is used a lot for a lot of texts. And the benefit here is you've only got a version you can read. Okay? So again, here's our example with our, our limited psalm. And we translated the thing you know, whenever we made copies. The drawback is that you have errors in translation, because that psalm is Latin. Well, let's just put it this way. The original it came from is in Latin. And in fact, the likelihood is that that was not even translated from the original Hebrew. It was probably translated from Greek into Latin. So you went Hebrew to Greek to Latin, giving you that page. And that gives you results like the, the sculpture on the bottom left there, which is uh, Michelangelo's Moses. Notice that he's got horns in his head. Uh, last I checked, Jews don't have horns on their head, but it's a mistranslation from the Bible. The original phrase was rays of light. It got mistranslated along the way, and now we have horns on Moses' head, which is probably not a very good thing. Okay? Now, uh, that's one way to go. Another way to go is to go with the, uh, what the Rosetta Stone does, which is just to say, well, instead of keeping along just the most recent version, we'll keep all the versions. And you've got a Rosetta Stone here, which has got hieroglyphs on top, hieratic in the middle, and then at the bottom you have Greek. Now the problem here is that, well, it still is hard to translate stuff. We needed a lot of help to translate the Egyptian. And this thing is really big. Notice that this stone, and chiseling stone is hard, three times bigger than it had to be because of the three different languages. So benefit is there's a better chance I can understand it. The drawback is it takes extra space, and we know everybody hates paying a lot for archival storage. So we want to be a little bit careful about doing something like that. So we talked about analog data. Let's move on to talking about digital data. Now, digital data has many of the same issues that analog data has. We've got to be able to preserve the actual bits and be able to read the actual bits. We need to have integrity guarantees for the information, and we need to be able to interpret the bits later on. But this being digital data, we've got other things we want. We want secrecy. We want to have authenticity and provenance, uh, in other words, linking the information to a particular party. And we want to have scalability, make this thing bigger and bigger, and we want to be able to search it. Now, for those who don't know what authenticity and provenance is, I'll give you an example. There's a, uh, you know, I, I have an auto, uh, I, I know of an autographed um, letter from Albert Einstein. Suppose I want to have one of those, and I want to make sure that it's real. Well, how do I know? One way to know it is know who got it from whom, who got it from whom, and say, well, Einstein sent it to person A, who sent it to person B, who sent it to me. Okay, well, now I know how it got there. But for bits, how do we track this information? How do we know where the bits came from? How do we know that those bits came from me or came from Einstein or came from someone else? If you're watching this presentation, how do you know the slides that are provided with it or even the voice belong to me and not to someone else? Now, of course, if you look at two days later, you can always ask me, but what about 100 years later or 500 years later? How do we preserve all this? 
Well, the first step that we've got to worry about is preserving the bits. And for that, we're just going to use media that lasts a very long time. After all, long live media work for analog data, why don't we just use digital data and do it the same way? So we could inscribe the bits in a stable medium. And in fact, it turns out that there's a company that does this uh, called Norsam. And they let you inscribe bits on a stainless steel medium with ion beam etching. And you can read the information with a powerful microscope. The information is stable for centuries to millennia. And this is great. <coughs> Only problem is, uh, well, this is this works, except it's very expensive. In fact, there are other technologies. For example, um, uh, Hitachi has announced a glass medium which is supposedly good for 100 million years. Okay, great, you can inscribe it this way, but again, it's not very dense. It can be more expensive. So what people do instead is they say, well, let's use magnetic cheap, cheaper media, cheaper to read and write, not as stable as stainless steel, but it'll last for 50 years. The problem now, and also a problem with stable media, is that they all need hardware that's specialized to read this. It is not trivial to build a tape reader that can read a tape today. You've got to get all the mechanics right. You've got to get the electronics right. This is not terribly easy to do. And the problem we're running into today is that there are tapes out there which, if we could find a reader, we could read. Now, notice I said, if we could find a reader. Not exactly easy. So we're actually thinking about using flash memory and disk for something like this, because at least they come with the readers built in. Okay? And of course, as Kylie has said, um, well, tape sucks. So we don't want to use tape, because tape has too many problems where I'm so close to getting the data, but I can't read the tape. Let's try and avoid that. Well, another thing we could do, of course, is make like, uh, old, like the monks of old and copy the bits over and over again. Right? So if digital media doesn't last too long, we could use more active archives that frequently, or at least relatively frequently, every five years or so, copy the data to the new media. Now, the benefit to this is that the data is always on devices that can be read, and we can get integrity checking for free, because what we can do is when we make the copies, we can go through the, we can go through the data and say, yep, that data hasn't changed. We've got some checksums that make sure of this. And it means that our systems can take advantage of, of storage technology, which advances every day. Now, there are drawbacks to this, obviously. The biggest one is that, well, there's an awful lot of data I've got to copy, right? You're talking about literally exabytes of data for somebody like YouTube. The second issue is that it requires more resources. Copying data over and over again gets to be very expensive, okay? And the third thing, and this is a real big issue, is that it requires active participation. You think about it, many of the things in Egypt and, and elsewhere haven't been actively maintained for literally thousands of years. If those things were sitting on the ancient equivalent of hard drives, that information would be completely gone, and that wouldn't be a very good thing. Okay. So now we have to start worrying about reliability. Again, we have an advantage now with media making it more reliable that the people who did, dealt with analog media didn't have. For digital media, there are going to be accidents. You're going to lose bits. I guarantee that. Okay. Disks will fail, flash will fail, the media will fail somehow. And digital data is not very robust against losing bits, unfortunately. So the moral is here, we're going to keep extra copies. So now we've got uh, several copies. We've got all our data here. We can keep parity, and parity lets us recover data. So this is great, but the thing is that, well, we've got to have extra copies even more, and we've got to be able to survive site disasters. A site disaster means, suppose that instead of a disk going bad, an entire data center burns down. This is actually not as rare as you think. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was a fire in Hollywood that destroyed a film archive. Well, imagine if that was the only copy of those films. We've lost that data forever. So what uh, our group has done some work in, I won't talk a lot about this, is to use multi-level erasure codes that allow us to, if we lose one site, recover using three other ones. Okay. Now, this is a nice idea, and in fact, a lot of people are starting to go to this approach, but it turns out it's something we really do need to do to make sure we don't actually lose data. Okay? Now, the next thing we have to worry about is device evolution. How do devices change over time? They get bigger, they get faster, they get more reliable, all that stuff. Now, when this happens, we have to take our system and put the new devices into it. So imagine if you started a system that was, go that was built 30 years ago and it had floppy disks in it. We would have gone through two, two generations of tape. That's the two things in the middle there. Maybe we go to disks. And we'd have to do this without ever copying all of the data you know, over and over again and saying, wheel out the old system, wheel in the new one. We wouldn't want that. right? So we've got to be able to handle multiple different generations of devices. And if one of the approaches that we're looking at, 
that I'll talk about in a minute is to use intelligent devices simply because networks evolve very, very slowly, especially compared to, to disks. It also means that we use intelligent devices, the internal details can be kept hidden so we have better compatibility backwards with older devices. But again, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay. Now, data integrity is the next thing we have to worry about. Okay. Data integrity just means how do we make sure that the data you're reading back is the data that was written? Now, obviously, we have to guard against accidental modification. Bits get flipped, data gets lost. Yeah, of course we know about that. An issue that's just as big is guarding against intentional modification like rewriting of history. Stalin was very famous for taking photographs and erasing people that he didn't want to be around. You'd like to know if somebody did that. Okay, now, sure, it may sound a little flippant. Well, so suppose somebody alters a photograph of things. Well, suppose somebody alters a birth certificate of a, of, a, of a child born in Hawaii in the early 1960s. Well, we have a very big problem now, don't we? Okay, so accident, intentional modification is very difficult to guard against because somebody can try to change not just the document itself, but any kind of integrity check that you have. So for something like this, it may be useful to have separate spheres of control, separate archives that are controlled independently, so that one person who decides to change the his, change history can't change all the copies. Right? A single corrupt node can corrupt everything it touches, but if you have multiple nodes that are working together, well, now you have to corrupt four or five places. Not impossible, but yeah, it gets more difficult. Okay? Now, the next thing we want to worry about is scalability. Okay? Scalability just means how do we make this thing bigger and bigger and bigger? Because right, archives are going to need to grow organically, because you can't build an, initially the archive at scale. You, you can't build an archive that starts out holding, say, you know, tens to hundreds of petabytes. You're going to start out building it small, a few hundred terabytes, and you'll start growing bigger and bigger and bigger. Right? Imagine if, some of that, if when the Library of Congress was built, Congress had had to authorize the entire massive scale that it exists at now. Right back when it started, the Library of Congress held you know a few hundreds, maybe a few thousands of books. No big deal. Now it holds millions. Well, same thing here. We've got to build an archive that grows organically because devices will age, they'll get older, they'll die, we'll get new devices. All this stuff has to happen smoothly. We can't have these jolts where we go from one kind of archive to another. This also means the archive has to function at both a small scale, where maybe it's got a few dozen devices in it, all the way up to maybe even millions of devices. After all, a million disks is only an exabyte of data, and YouTube alone at Google has an exabyte of data at this point. People want to store more and more stuff, and so we have to be able to reconcile both scalability and the ability to function at a small scale. Well, one of the projects that, that, that we, we did to work on this is a project called Pergamum. And the goal behind Pergamum is to develop a cost-efficient storage system that can evolve over time. And again, this is a project that our group did several years ago. The idea here was we were going to build an archive out of small, relatively independent things called tomes, each one of which is smart enough to function independently, but of course you put them together and you get redundancy that goes between tomes. Basically, these things are building blocks for more complex systems. So a couple of reasons that this worked very well. The first one is that we can handle errors at multiple levels. In other words, if there's an error on a disk, try to handle it locally. If a disk fails, then you go to other disks to deal with it. Okay. Now, the two things we have to be able to do is control cost, because if there's one thing people doing archiving know, it's nobody ever wants to pay to store stuff. So building, building out commodity hardware, using standard interfaces, but not just controlling the cost of buying a thing. You've got to make sure that it costs very little to run. right? After all, if, it, if it's cheap to buy, but it costs you a lot of money to run it, and disks, by the way, do, unless you power them down, it's a problem. In fact, these days, if you keep a disk running all the time, it will cost almost as much in five years to run the disk in terms of electricity as it costs to buy it in the first place. So what Pergolum did is it said, look, we're going to have a tome. That's this guy over here, right? So this is our tome. And a tome is composed of a, uh, one, uh, of a disk, maybe two disks. It's got data stored in segments. It's got a low-power CPU. Remember, low-power CPU right here, yeah, there are plenty of CPUs out there that use a watt or less. They, you have them in your cell phone. They can run at a gigahertz or more. It's got some non-volume memory and also some DRAM. And it's got a network connection. Again, something like gigabit Ethernet. These things are all cheap. 
In fact, you can buy a, um, a Raspberry Pi for 25 bucks that has everything here except for the disk. So disk plus $25 plus whatever you want to pay for your cabinet, that's how much it costs to buy a tome. Okay? Now, the reason for using Ethernet as a connector is that if there's one thing that tends to change slowly, it's networks. The reason it changes slowly is there's an awful lot of physical infrastructure that depends on Ethernet. So, you know, if you look today, there's all these outlets and houses that have gigabit Ethernet connection, connectors. They're not going to change overnight, and you'll be able to use an Ethernet network for the next 10 to 20 years because that's how long it will take people in buildings to get around to ripping them out now and replacing them with something new. So networks change slowly. Let's, that's the only thing we have to worry about. Okay. Now, with this design, we actually have two-level reliability. What that means is that if you look over here at Tone Zero, it stores data. That's the white stuff. And then it's got parity for the, for the data stored on the tome itself. So if there's an error in any six of these blocks, six here, we can recover it by just looking at the parity and saying, you know, we can recover that one sector error. Okay? That means that we have increased reliability because the likelihood the disk will lose data due to losing one or two blocks is very small. And we can also fix errors with as little spin up as possible because small errors, we don't have to worry about them. What happens if an entire disk like this were to fail? Well, that disk were to fail, and we wanted to read this block, we'd read this block, this redundancy block, and this block, and generate the new and regenerate the data that was missing from the device that failed. So we can fix errors locally, and we can fix errors that occur because an entire tome fails. Now, this, by the way, shows parity as being exactly one block per, per line. In fact, that amount is controllable. In the real system, we actually had uh, two to four parity per redundancy per, per local disk. So this is actually two to four blocks. And in fact, the redundancy group was typically 12 data disks and four parity disks. But the idea is the same. If we do something like this, we can actually recover from errors both at locally and large scale. Now, we have, to do, we have to make sure, in order to guarantee integrity, that we can check to make sure our data is correct. So periodically, a tome is going to wake up, check all of its data, read the segment, including the parity, and verify that it's consistent with the, that the data and parity are consistent to one another. And it's going to record the signatures, and I'll talk about what signatures are in the non-volatile memory. Now, eventually, we're going to have to scrub the entire disk. We can't do this by just scrubbing a small amount of data, by, by just scrubbing a little bit and saying, yeah, good enough. But the nice thing is that if we have a one terabyte disk, we could scrub a gigabyte, two, maybe ten every time the disk is powered on, and then that'll mean that we scrub the, the whole disk over a period of, let's say, 100 power cycles, which might take it a month. Well, that's okay. So as long as we know the disk is scrubbed within a year, intradisk parity makes data loss highly unlikely due to a, due to a sector going bad. Okay? And the other thing to be aware of is if we power the disk on and scrub, let's say, ten gigabytes, well, we don't know that all the data is okay, but we know the disk is basically working. And that's, that means that we can detect disks that are dead or nearly dead. So we don't have to scrub everything all at once. We just scrub a little bit at a time. So how do we do the scrubbing? Well, suppose we have, in this case, uh, n data disks and one parity. Okay? Here's what we do. We can take the signatures of each one of these. So the signature of D0, signature of D1, and so on. Okay? Now, Notice that the XOR of D0, D1, and all that stuff equals P. Well, it turns out the exact same relationship holds for the signatures as held for the original data. Okay? And this works with codes calculated over all kinds of things, including even odd, X codes, read Solomon, etc. And what we do is we calculate these signatures during writes and during scrubs, and we store them in NVRAM to make sure that we don't have to spin the disk up just to check correctness across disks. So this, so this is good for checking locally on one disk. What about across disks? Well, here's what we do. Notice that here we've got four tones labeled 0 through 3. Okay? Now, individually, each one of them generates the signatures for each of the segments on its disk. Okay? Welcome to GoToWebinar. Web Welcome to go to Welcome to GoToWebinar, web events made easy. Correct. We know that the XOR together may equal. But let's say there's a problem here. Let's say that 
We actually exchange them, and they're not equal. Now how do we find the fault? Well, we go to each disk and say, you know, we check, and the left-hand signatures do actually equal. The ones on the right don't. So we know the left-hand side of the tree is correct, the right-hand side of the tree is wrong. We go to the left, and we discover, okay, the left-hand side of the tree is wrong. Well, maybe the right-hand side is, maybe it isn't, but we know the left-hand side is wrong. Therefore, we check. Are those correct? Well, let's see. They are correct, but this one, the one on tone one is not. That's a signature that's wrong, and that's where we at. Well, we know we have to fix it. Again, it's very efficient. It doesn't have to be all done at the same time. We can actually do this asynchronously as well. Well, okay, so that's great. We were actually able to store the data reliably. But now let's say we want to actually guarantee integrity. Well, there's a system called Locks. Welcome to GoToWebinar, web events made easy. Copies, keep stuff safe, at lots of sites. Things like academic papers. There's a very high level of redundancy to avoid data loss, and there's zero secrecy. This is for public data. So you've got multiple independent archives that keep copies of one document. But what Lox is very concerned about is what happens if somebody decides they want to change the past. Well, archives periodically exchange what they think the right version of the document is, and if anybody disagrees, the archives vote on who's right, and majority wins. Now, the nice thing about this is that if you have 40 copies and uh, somebody manages to compromise 10 of those copies, the other 30 outvote the 10, and the correct version is sent to all the archives that store the document. Which means that if we're talking about one or two, somebody modifying a document, one or two archives, even deliberately, it's very robust against this. Now, of course, to be fair, it is actually kind of wasteful of space. But again, this is done for things that we want to have lots and lots of copies of. So it's not done for my photos, but it's done for academic papers. It's done for books, maybe done for Hollywood movies, that kind of thing. Okay. Now, it turns out that locks can also migrate formats. It can convert, let's say, from GIF, from GIF to PNG. Now, LOX, on the other hand, does wait. It doesn't do it proactively. It just waits till someone uses it, which, of course, means that it's got to have converter code around for old formats and converting them into new formats, and you've got to keep the converter code up to date. So if we go from PNG to you know, PNG2, well, we've got to have something that converts GIF to PNG2, maybe by going through PNG, to make sure that you can actually convert the old format, any old format you have, to any new format. Now, LOX does keep the original format, so it does what the Rosetta Stone does. It presents the information in the new format, but on the other hand, if you're interested, you can get the old format too, which may be helpful in case the old format to new format conversion is lossy or has errors in it. Okay? All right. So we've talked about a couple of example systems. Let's go back to seeing what else we need. We need to have indexing and searching. With analog data, there's just not that much searching to be done. And uh, as someone who's old enough to remember card catalogs and librarians, well, that's the way you found data in an analog system. Okay. Ethan? Yes. A quick question uh, on your locks uh, slide, um, if you can just go back. Um, I guess, uh, you know, if you're talking about format changes, are we talking about, you know, MP3 to MP4 type formats? Or are we envisaging with something very complex where maybe the entire representation of the data has changed? You know, I, I guess if you're talking about really, really long-term archival, you know, where, you know, if you talk about Dead Sea Scrolls to now, there's actually a significant change not just in the data but in the language that we currently use from... No, exactly, exactly. So here we're talking about format changes. There's no notion of being able, for example, to mechanically translate from English to Rigelian, okay? okay? So we're not talking about that, all right? We're talking about, I have an image, and I want to keep it as an image, but we used to use GIF and nobody uses that anymore. Let's translate it to something that they do use. So. Uh, MP3 to, for example, um, AAC, which is a which is a newer um, which is a newer audio codec, or MP, you know, or MPEG to MP4 to you know some other kind of a new video codec, right? Right. So that's the kind of stuff we're talking about here. We're not talking about doing mechanical translation. That's just too hard. And is the and is the format representation, which say for example, we were supporting MP3 to MP4, is the does the system itself encapsulate what MP3 is, uh, independent of an outside agent? Well, yes, it has the converters inside of it. Of course, obviously, someone has to write that converter. So yes, okay. I mean, there's, somebody has to write the converter to go from MP3 to AAC, and you know that's I mean, and, and someone's got to manually do that. The system doesn't know how to do that automatically. Okay. There's got to be code in there that actually does that. And there, the problem here is that for common formats, it's not a big deal. 
right? MP3, it's going to be around for a while. JPEG is actually a pain in the neck to read, but it'll be around for a while. But for rarer formats, this could be a real problem. Okay, and that's something that locks, you know, this is why people, when you put things in locks, you want to make sure it's in a pretty standardized format. Uh, PDF, by the way, may not be the best format because it's interpreted, but we'll get to that later. Okay? Right. So when we're talking about indexing and searching, again, we want to do this because people want to store literally exabytes of data. So indexing and searching has got to be A, efficient, and B, scalable. A single large index is a very bad idea. The reason it's a bad idea is that, well, if that single large index ever fails, you are in very, very big trouble. Okay? Imagine that you have an exabyte of data. An exabyte of data is on the order of a million disk drives. Imagine there's one big index for all of that, and it fails. Sure, you can read all million drives to, read, to get your data back, and if you read all million drives, and you can read them at 100 gigabytes a second, which is, after all, very fast, right? An exabyte of data at 100 megabytes a second takes approximately 10 million seconds. That is four months. So if you, read, you can read your archive at 100 gigs a second, rebuilding that index will take you four months. Of course, if you can read it at 10, megabytes a, at 10 gigabytes a second, it will take you 40 months or three years. Clearly, you don't want this at all, do you? So you want to make sure that having a self-contained media index is a good thing because if you do that, instead of having to read everything, you say, well, this part of the index failed, reread that one drive. That's not so bad. Reread everything could be very bad. But now the question comes up, how do you build an index that actually is built out of lots and lots of separate small individual indexes? And that's actually an area that we're working on right now. So it's a definitely an interesting area to look at. Now, authenticity and provenance is the next area that we want to worry about. And again, it's critical to know where a document came from, like how was it generated and which documents were involved in creating this. And the reason is that we want to make sure that this document really came from where we think it came from. Okay? If we have a document that says, here is a summary of, you know, here's a summary of, of, the, um, of data from the U.S. Census, we want to make sure that we can actually look at the original data that led into this and make sure there's no error there. So the systems have to record the information. Obviously, we want, to, we want to reduce the information to save space, but we also want to make sure that we, can, that we prevent against compromise of this to guarantee authenticity. And authenticity can use two different approaches. We talked about consensus-based, which is what we talked about earlier with locks, or cryptographic, which is a public key-based signature. And there are mechanisms to do this, but I, I, don't have time to go, I don't have a lot of time to go into them. I'll briefly mention preservation data stores, though. Um, preservation data stores, uh, are basically a technique that, that was developed by IBM that allows information to be defined as a package. And essentially, it defines a data format that is self-contained, meaning the stored information includes the data and the tools you need to interpret the data. So for that question earlier about formats, you'd make sure that a data, that a data store was actually composed not just of the GIF, but also of, of at least one reference to a GIF to, let's say, a PNG or GIF or whatever converter allows you to display it. So it makes very heavy use of provenance. Okay. Now, data secrecy is another issue. A lot of people don't think about data secrecy as a big problem, but when data sticks around for literally decades to hundreds of years, it's a very big problem. Okay? Because encryption can be broken over time, both because of increased computing power, like, for example, DES, better algorithms and new techniques, or, as we've learned recently with the NSA, because they put backdoors into the encryption algorithm in the first place. Okay, so long-term secrecy has to deal with this problem. Sure, you could say I'll periodically re-encrypt data, but again, if you have an exabyte of data, how long is it going to take you to re-encrypt at 10 gigabytes a second? For that four months, your data is going to be vulnerable to anybody who can break in. Now, one of the things we did work on, and I don't have time to talk about it, but I'm happy to discuss that afterwards if people have to ask questions, would like to ask questions, is to use authentication instead of encryption. So split your data across multiple archives, and then, basically, when somebody asks for the data, require them to go to multiple archives and get the pieces they want and combine those pieces. So it would be as though, you, in order to get your money back, you have to get Wells Fargo, Bank of America, and Chase to all agree that you were allowed to have it. Once they all agreed, you could rebuild your data. But, going to, but taking over Bank of America or evil people at Bank of America wouldn't be able to help you. But long-term security is a really big problem, and that's one of the ones we're very actively working on today. So let's shift gears a bit and talk about meaning, right? We've been talking about preserving bits, and that's great, but how do we preserve the actual meaning of digital data? Because very often it doesn't have an obvious meaning. 
Some data is simple to interpret. Ask the text, hey, it's only got an 8-bit character code. How hard is that? GIF is only a 33-page standard. It's got compression in it. Um, Postscript, which is part of PDF, is actually an interpreted language. Good luck with that one. Microsoft Word and Excel are incredibly hard to, to, to interpret. And databases are also very, very difficult to deal with. And these things all change over time. So how, do you be, how can you read an old document today? This is actually a very big problem in, in, in uh, digital preservation, and one which doesn't get a lot of attention and is probably going to result in the loss of information. For example, one thing you could do is you could emulate. Okay? So if you wanted to do emulation, right, what you could do is say, you know, I'm going to keep around an execution environment that can run an old version of Microsoft Word. And I'll use Providence to track which environment is necessary. So for example, I might have a single environment for Word 97 and say, anybody who needs to use Word 97 can use this one environment. Ethan. Now, this sounds like a great idea, but there are a lot of implicit customizations like licenses and things like that that you've got to worry about. Now, keeping these execution environments running isn't that easy. I mean, uh, sure, you can run old x86 environments, but what about an Apple II? What about a Commodore 64? Could you really run those today? Um, you could use simplified environments, and in fact, uh, Raymond Lurie has proposed using something called a universal virtual computer, basically a fancy Turing machine, and you can also layer uh, environments on top of one another, uh, the uh, comment being it's turtles all the way down. Uh, this approach can be kind of slow and may or may not work depending on how custom you need the environment to be. Ethan, okay, a so quick question here. Yes. Um, a questioner asks, if nothing were done to the current forms of storage, say hard disk or flash drive, how long on average do they last? Good question. I was going to get to that a little bit, but the answer depends on the type of storage. For disks, typically five to eight years at most. Okay. For flash, it's not as clear, but they think at least 20 to 30 years. And for both, in both cases, there are ways that they can deal with the hardware, modify the technology such that they can make them last longer if they wanted to. But I'll get to that in a minute when we talk about some of the modeling we're doing to decide how long should a device last. That's actually a very important question. Okay, so let's talk about another approach to, of course, preserving meaning is to migrate, as we talked about before, translate stuff. So in other words, if we refresh the representation, we copy it, well, that's great, okay? Uh, it turns out that there's a big issue here. Um, as an example, my mother, who is a rabbi, has sermons that she wrote in Word Perfect about version 2. I mean, these sermons are literally 20-plus years old, okay? And so there's a real problem. When we moved around to a Mac, we said, well, we've got all these old sermons. How are we going to read them? It turns out Microsoft Word can't read them. Word Perfect, I don't know if you can even get it for a Mac anymore. The only thing that could read them, thankfully, was OpenOffice. Okay? So hopefully you've got something you can read all your old documents. If not, uh, to give you another example, um, I don't know that I could read my thesis in its original source form. Why? Because I used FrameMaker. And well, guess what? FrameMaker, I think Adobe still supports it, kind of on some systems. But I'm not sure I can read the original source, source information for my thesis, which is why I now use LaTeX. It's all in plain text, much easier to read. Okay? Now, um, the, be the, the benefits, of course, to this is, is that you get to keep a cult. There's no need to keep a complex virtual environment around, and you've only got software that can read the most recent version. But the drawback is that the translated copy may not, may not have everything you expected from the original. So, for example, PDF is rendered to bitmap, I lose some notion of all the letters. If I take a PNG and convert it to JPEG, I actually lose information. And now you have to ask the question, does the translated copy really mean the same thing as the original did? Right? In the case of a JPEG, it doesn't. There you lose detail in the black parts of the image. That's not what you want. Okay? All right, so now I want to talk briefly about the economics of archival storage. Right? The idea is that users want to pay for archival storage once when you create the data. Um, and then, of course, that's because new data is most frequently used. Many models collect money every time you use it, like Flickr and YouTube show you ads. The problem is that archival storage has costs that are ongoing, things like refresh cycles for data and media and management costs. And as we all probably know, usage tends to fall off very dramatically as your data ages. Okay, so for example, um, you know, you want to trade off high initial costs against high ongoing costs. For example, I want to use Flash, costs more up front, but I don't have to keep replacing it. Okay? Maybe do I want to pay for ongoing storage with revenue for new data? Well, that may not be sustainable in the long term, and I'll show you why in a minute. 
Now, of course, we could get rid of much of the data, but who decides which data we get rid of? And, uh, you know, who decides, who decides which data should I get rid of? So here's an example of what I'm talking about. Okay? Um, all right. I've got exponential growth in demand for the first five years. So you can see over here, right, here's my first five years. Let's say we're something like YouTube or whatever, okay? Now, if I have an increase in growth rate, all right, uh, unfortunately, my animation uh, managed to do the wrong thing. If I have an increase in growth rate, I use the bottom curve here, okay? So in other words, if my growth rate, if I grew 20% last year, 30% this year, most of my data is new data, and I'm okay. Now, if I have a level growth rate, we're on the second curve here, this kind of lighter green one, okay? Where the old data to new data ratio remains approximately constant if my growth rate is level. But if I have a level growth amount, in other words, I add, you know, 100 petabytes a year, the ratio of old data new, to new data grows rapidly. Well, here's the problem. Let's say you're Facebook. Exactly how much growth does Facebook have left? Okay, one of eight people on the planet is already a member of Facebook. You know, I'm pretty sure they're going to be pegged at about 8x growth over the next however many years you want to go, unless they open up the Mars market, in which case maybe they're going to be okay. Okay, but the thing is that as long as people start storing more and more data each year, they're fine. Well, but here's the problem. I don't take any more photos this year than I did last year. The photos aren't that much bigger this year than they were last year either. So the amount of data I add to Facebook every year isn't growing that much, right? Sure, you can say maybe I'll add video, but unless you start doing 3D video, Facebook and Google and YouTube and Flickr are going to be on this curve, and that means they've got to make more and more data for the new data to pay for all the old data they're keeping around. This is a very real problem for archival storage. Well, one of the things we're working on now is predicting long-term storage costs. Okay, So we're building a model that incorporates predicted storage costs and density, models of reliability, the cost of money, should we buy stuff now or later. All of these things can vary over time. So our model is going to include predictable costs and random events that might impact costs as well. We use Monte Carlo simulation. We run our models hundreds of times. And basically, we use different assumptions for sets of runs to try and understand trade-offs. Okay. Let me give you an example. We had an earlier question asking, how long does a disk or, or flash last? Well, here's an example. If growth rates for disk and flash remain high at about 50, 40 to 50 percent a year, the answer is that there is no benefit to having a disk last longer than about three years. Why? Because five years from when you buy the disk, new disks are going to be so much bigger that it's worth it to throw out a perfectly good disk and replace it with one that is 25 times bigger. So as long as growth rates for storage media remain high, it doesn't pay to make your storage media last a long time. Now, if you think about it, this actually has a very important meaning. It says, look, as long as you can build your newer disks bigger and bigger at a fast rate, don't make them last longer than three years. Don't spend time on reliability. Just tell people to replace them after five years. It's cheaper that way. Now. As growth rates slow, one of the things we're, we're, we're learning now is that when growth rates slow, this curve flattens, and it does pay to have them last longer. So the, long, so the length of time you should design your device to last depends on how quickly newer devices are getting bigger. Well, that's something we didn't know before we did these simulations. Okay. Now, another thing we look at, of course, is things like the impact of real-world events on cost. And over here we have... Um, we have a picture of what happened uh, if we had something like the, the, the floods in Thailand from a few years ago. Notice that right here, there's a blip in how much we had to put in initially, which means that if we wanted to cover a blip like this, we'd have to put in more money initially in order to have our data get a 95 chance of surviving for 100 years because right here, it cost us much more money to, to, to do a media refresh. Well, again, longer-lived media gives you more flexibility on timing may make that blip less likely. This is the kind of work that we're doing to try and understand the relationship between how much you have to put in at the start and how likely you are to have your data survive for a very long time. Okay? So as I said, we're doing ongoing research right now, and I'm happy to talk more about that during the, the question and answer period, but just study the trade-offs between endowment size and data protection level and, and whether your archives are Question? Okay. So, we are now studying, you know, real-world scenarios like, for example, what if we what if we use flash, cloud storage, disk? Do we have longer lifetime, higher upfront cost, maybe higher reliability, or higher density? Which one works better? We're also trying to look at disruptive technologies. Suppose someone came up with a new technology in 10 years that dropped your cost a factor for 20. 
how you know how likely is that to happen? And then uh, once it does happen, should you have done A or B? So we're trying to do modeling to understand this. Now the reason we care about this is that I'm worried that we're going to have a digital dark age sometimes sometime soon because think about it. How much of your stuff is online? How much of it is physical, right? You know, from our from my grandparents, I have tons of actual physical pictures where if I go to the shoebox, I can pull the pictures out and look at them. But I've taken 50,000 pictures over the last 10 years, and they're all online. They're all on my laptop or in the cloud. All of my, my communications are, are, are online. I mean, uh, letters from, you know, your, your grandfather, you know, from your, between your grandmother and grandfather while they, you know, while they were off in World War II. You can look at the letters today. You don't need special hardware and software for it. You know, what about, uh, what about today? Old photos and video. <coughs> Again, that stuff is all going to be online. Okay. Now, sites that the typically store this stuff are supported by ads. Users look at the new stuff a lot, but the old stuff, yeah, nobody uses it. So, what's going to happen to those ten-year-old photos you're storing on Flickr? Right. Old data, as we saw, is going to dominate capacity and cost. So, how is Yahoo going to pay for it? Maybe they'll start to prune the old data like old photos. They'll throw out ninety percent of them and. Will you notice? Will you care about it? Yeah, a lot of people might. And the question is, are you willing to pay for long-term archiving? Now, there's an organization called the Chronicle of Life that, that looks at this, but the problem is they want $1,000 a gigabyte as, a, as an upfront endowment, and most people say, well, there's no way I'm paying that. So what are we going to do about this? How are we going to make sure that all of our digital data can be passed along 100 years later? Okay. All right. So basically, to summarize here, um, what we've got is challenges of preserving data for the long term. We've got to archive literally 10 to the 18 bits and make sure it's reliable and make sure that none of our data gets broken, be able to search it, be able to scale it, be able to manage it. I've got to make sure that I, the bits don't just last for decades. They've got to be able to be readable and usable in decades. So I've got migration and emulation. Now, the thing is that I've got to integrate all of this into a system that can evolve over a century. And this is incredibly difficult. Because it involves issues not just of technology, but also of economics and policy. And the thing is that we've got to be able to solve this if we're, if, if, if we're going to expect to, survive, to pass our data on to, the next, to our next generation. So this is a really critical thing here, right? Because, you know, long-term di digital preservation is actually critically important. I mean, the fate of the world's data is at, is at stake. And this is why it's such an important thing and why I'm surprised more people aren't working on it. I guess it's a hard problem and that makes it kind of less popular. So the problem isn't going to go away. Right? The only way for it to go away is to go back to writing things down on paper and that's just not going to happen. And the problem is getting worse. Unfortunately, it's getting worse very fast and by the time we have things ready to do something about it, I'm hoping it won't be too late. Because today it's largely ad hoc. There's no good, there, there are a few good efforts in this direction, but how many people organize the way they save all their photos? Most people don't. There are solutions, but some of them address at most a couple of things, but not everything. And there are a lot of problems left to be solved, so research here is a high potential for impact, which is one of the reasons we're working on it. Okay? But as I said, this really is a, a, an issue of the fate of the, world's, of the world's data. The fate of the world's future and knowledge of the past is really what we're talking about here. Do we want to end up like a society, you know, do, do we want to end up like, for example, uh, England of 1066. And I'll, and I'll close with this kind of analogy to think about. Back in, around, back in the 11th century, right after William the Conqueror took over England, he commissioned a census, which is now known as the Doomsday, as the Domesday Book. This thing was taken in the 11th century, and it was still readable a thousand years later. Okay? So to commemorate the, I believe it was the 900th anniversary of, the census, of, of this thing, the, I think it was the British government, maybe the BBC as well, commissioned a 20th century Domesday book, okay? And being, you know, great, they said, hey, we're going to do, we're going to take all these pictures, we're going to store it digitally, and we're going to store it on the latest and greatest mechanism for storing data like this. They stored it on LaserDisc. So you could read a 900-year-old Domesday book without too much trouble. But exactly how easy would it be to read a Domes, the Domesday book from the 20th century, which is now only about 20 to 30 years old? It's not clear you could actually read the new Domesday book. The old one, 900 years old, no problem. The new one, 30 years old, already fading, already not necessarily readable. Is that the position we want the rest of the world data to be in? So with that, I'm more than happy to take questions. I've got links to places you can look up some of the things we've talked about. And 
I, I've sent a partial list of collaborators because if I leave somebody off, I want to make sure that I don't uh, don't get in trouble for it. So with that, I'm happy to take questions. Yes, with that, let me, uh, uh, you know, uh, for folks that want to ask questions, uh, you know, please unmute yourself or send me the questions via chat. I see that there are two questions here, so let me begin with that. Uh, first is a hypothetical question. Let's say we are hit by a meteor, like the one that erased the dinosaurs, except for a small tribal population in Africa. All humans are dead and all knowledge is mostly lost. In about 10,000 years during excavation, a human comes across a piece of steel etched digital data. With the current thoughts on digital data preservation, can this data be read? Can it, can it be interpreted? So that's a very good question. It depends on how you design it. So one of the things to think about is when we sent uh, the Voyager spacecraft out of the solar system, we actually put a disk. It was actually gold-plated to be resistant to, space, to, to the problems in space. We actually etched things like waveforms on it that actually corresponded to sound. The disk itself contains pictographic on how you would take that disk and build a player that would play it back. Now, if you were to provide all that in the same disk, you might be OK. By the way, it turns out that ion beam etching is another way to do it, and that is that it's not restricted to ones and zeros. You could actually etch little images on it. In fact, it's likely you might do something like that if you had a large set of these. You would have a bunch of them with digital data, perhaps, because it's more efficient, and then have one or two of them that, that actually in pictures describe how to build a reader. Now, of course, if you have a tribe of humans that uh, are barely out of the Stone Age, they're not going to be able to do this, okay? Really, really, that's a problem. But on the other hand, if cockroaches become intelligent, uh, you, know, five, you know, hundreds of thousands of years after the meteor, they should be, they, they could, with proper preparation, probably be able to read this stuff if it was on data that was preserved, was able to be preserved for that period of time. And that's a big if, of course, right? You have to give people hints on how to actually translate things, and we may be some of the first people to think about the fact that that's important. The ancient Egyptians didn't usually worry about that, with the exception of the Rosetta Stone. Certainly the people on the island of Crete, the Minoan civilization, didn't think of providing translation for future generations. It didn't occur to them. Now we know that that's an issue, and so because we know it's an issue, we can take steps to try and make that easier. And if we have a stack of 100 digital disks, we might provide a couple of analog disks that you can read with a microscope, same kind of technology, that tell you how to build a reader for the other ones. Does that answer the question? If, if not, uh, promote, please uh, ask another one. Uh, let's see, the second question that's coming online is, are there any solutions for critical data versus non-critical data? For example, can you mark your photos and ensure that marked photos are saved? Well, so again, this would be something where it would be up to whoever's providing the archival storage. You certainly could do something where uh, let's say you assign a ranking to your photos. You know, you know, rank of one means save it at all costs, and rank of ten means eh, get rid of it if you want. Um, there are a couple of drawbacks with doing that, though. And, and there are some, by the way, there are some people who propose trying to do that automatically. The big drawback to doing that labeling manually is it takes a lot of time. Heck, I can barely have enough time to put my photos into aperture. I don't have any time to go through and label who's in the picture and everything else, right? Ideally, I'd like to have time for that, but most people don't bother, right? So what you might, you know, so saying, you know, going through and saying you're allowed to mark one in every ten photos or one in every hundred as preserve at all costs, it's a nice idea. But then you'd have to say one in every ten or one in every hundred, or alternatively, no more than twenty photos a month can be marked as save at all costs. Something like that. If you're doing something like that, essentially what you're doing is giving a hint to the provider saying, if you have to delete something, don't delete these photos. And if you have the time and energy and desire to do that, great. But most people don't. Most people don't have a good idea of which ones to save. But there's a second problem to think about. Some of the most useful stuff we have from 1,000, 2,000 years ago is stuff that people would think of as being absolutely pedestrian, don't bother saving this, right? Mm -hmm. Things like birth and death records. You know, most people say, ah, oh, look, I mean, I, I don't want to save a picture of that. But it turns out that those pictures can often be very, very useful because there's things in those pictures that show us what daily life was like 500 years ago or 1,000 years ago, okay? Sure, you look at it and say, well, I'd like to save the great works of art from, from ancient Rome. But then again, uh, if you look at things they found in Pompeii, some of the most interesting stuff is graffiti because it tells you about what the common people were doing. Well, you know, sure, we'll save all the great works, but did we think of saving the graffiti? Because that's actually pretty important. That's what most of the population is using. And if you apply the same thing to pictures, you're going to save the photos because you think they're important of, 
so-and-so's 50th wedding anniversary or some other big thing. What we really want is, you know, pictures of us out for lunch enjoying a hamburger. Those are going to be useful for understanding society 100 years from now. And nobody's ever going to mark those as don't delete it ever because they don't, it doesn't occur to them to say it. Right. We'll um, I think there is a related question. Will, you want to ask it? I think I've unmuted you. Oh, sure. Okay. Uh, I think you kind of uh, addressed this a little bit, but I think the modern attitude is that we can save everything for almost no efforts and almost for free. Mm -hmm. uh, but it seems like at least the, many of the examples from the past that you bring up, like the Rosetta Stone, uh, were intended to be stored for a long time and were produced at great expense. Uh, how do you think that these two attitudes would be reconciled? So, so some of them were, some of them weren't, okay? So, for example, the Rosetta Stone, I agree with you completely. That was a steely, and that was clearly designed to last for a long time. Same thing, as, same thing with, with many of the other Egyptian tombs, because when, you, when your writing is chiseling it on, on hard stone, it costs a lot. You're not going to do that just because. However, if you go to the point where we're talking about things on parchment or things, you know, paint on walls, that's why I use the Pompeii example, the parchments we found, the Dead Sea Scrolls we found, were not designed to last for a long time. They explicitly weren't. They were designed to be available, and if you wanted another one, if it got old, you would copy it over and make a new one. I mean, that, that was done already in the time, in the time, in the first temple period. They were making copies of this stuff. They assumed that the, that the parchments were going to last forever, right? Um, same thing is true of things like graffiti. Same thing is true of almost anything people did. It wasn't designed to last for a long time because the assumption is, well, we'll just make another copy of it. Okay? So if you look at things like, for example, from the medieval period, people would sp spend a lot of time copying the Bible and important books over and over again. I mean, in the, in the 1300s, a big library would have 50 books in it. That's a big library. The printing press made it possible to print lots and lots of stuff, but again, many, many things that have been printed have been lost to time because nobody bothered making extra copies of them. Okay? And, and just to give you some example of this, suppose I were to tell you about, uh, you know, suppose I were to ask you, should you keep paintings from an artist who only sold one painting ever in his entire life? Right? Would you think that those paintings are valuable and ought to be kept? Okay? If the answer to that is no, I will point out that Vincent Van Gogh only ever sold one painting in his entire life. Now, at this point, a Van Gogh is worth millions, and part of the reason is that a lot of people didn't keep the paintings he did because they were, they were deemed to be worthless. Well, now we've changed our mind on that. It turns out that that happens a lot. Something you did back then turns out, seems like it would be worthless, but now it's worth a lot. I'll give you another example uh, at, at the risk of, you know, pictures of a young kid with a black father and a white mother in Hawaii from the 1960s. You know, if someone had gone to, if someone had gone to Barack Obama's parents and said, your kid's going to be president one day, how hard would they have laughed at him, right? Those pictures are valuable. They give you insight into what the guy was like as a kid. Well, we should keep them around, but really, Barack Obama in the 1960s, not a very important person. I mean, you know, no offense, but he wasn't. So it's very hard to tell what will be important in 50 years. We can guess at it, but we don't know. And that means that we run the risk of losing information that we would have wanted to keep. The question, as you bring up, is how much are we willing to spend to keep around stuff that isn't going to be valuable just to keep the small amount of stuff that is? And that's a very valid question to ask. Great. Folks, any, any other questions for Professor Miller? I guess uh, if there are none, um, I think we all have uh, Professor Miller's coordinates uh, on the slides. The slides will actually be uh, both online as well as this entire recording uh, will be on YouTube. Uh, for those that need to get in touch with Professor Miller, either contact him directly or send me an email and I'll put you in touch with him. Um, but I guess, uh, Professor Miller, we do this uh, little tradition at these webinars because uh, obviously uh, uh, we are all at uh, disparate uh, corners of the United States and perhaps even the globe. Um, we actually extend our speaker a warm um, applause. Uh, so I guess uh, why don't we all unmute your microphones for, uh, at this time and let's all extend Professor Miller a warm virtual applause here. So, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, all of you, for attending. Thank you, Professor Miller, for your uh, uh, presentation. Our next seminar. Oh, by the way, please do. Uh, you you guys will all get an email with uh, uh, you know feedback uh, for the seminar. Please uh, enter in the feedback so that we can keep improving it. Our next seminar is on December 11th, when Steve Grand will 
present his uh, in, insights and research into artificial life when he presents I'm Not an Algorithm on December 11th, Friday at noon. With that, it's a wrap. Thank you all. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.